the many masks of Gideon. God has a mission to be done. Ironically, I guess God could have done it himself, couldn't he? I mean, he could have squished those Midianites, kind of like I used to squish anthills when I was a little boy. He could have just went pop and problem solved, right? The funny thing is, is that's usually how we want God to deal with my problem. God, take care of it for me. Lord, you see that, pro- that person that's causing me difficulty? Squish them. Take them out of the situation. Lord, make it easy for me. Of course, we've made a big assumption here. We have made the assumption that Midian is the problem. But I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I want to go back and and help you remember that um, God called Gideon to save Israel. This is what it says in Judges chapter 6, verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength that you, that you have. Save Israel out of, the, out of Midian's hand. I am I not sending you. So this is the book of Judges. And again, I want to remind you of the endless loop that Israel has caught themselves in. It is the loop that, well, Israel has forsaken God. Not the other way around. Israel moved away from God. And well, God is now allowing people to persecute Israel. And well, um, the people of Israel cry out to God. Then um, God voluntold somebody to go and take care of the problem. Now, that is the word correctly. I did not misspell that. None of the 13 judges that are mentioned in the book of Judges and in 1 Samuel, none of them went to God and said, Ooh, God, pick me. Pick me. I want to go. No, most of them, God had to come. Well, all of them, God had to come. And most of them, God had to do some pretty significant convincing to get them to go and do what God had asked them to do. And then eventually, God wore them down. And, well, the judge yields and takes on the task. Israel is saved. But the cycle repeats itself. Over and over and over until finally Israel says, we've got a solution to the problem, God. We need a king. This is what they said in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4, 4 and 5. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old. That's a nice way to greet him, right? You're old, okay? And your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as the, all the other nations have. Interesting, they um, were now going to look for a man to lead them instead of God. All these years, God had been fighting their battles, and now they're like, we need a king to go fight our battles, because God, you're not doing it the way we want. Here's a piece of fact that maybe you didn't know. So next time you're on Jeopardy and they're asking weird trivia questions, here's one to file away. Saul was the first king of Israel, but do you know who the first choice was? That's Gideon, folks. Judges chapter 8, verse 22, this is what it says. Then the Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Really? Did Gideon save them from the hand of Midian? I don't think so. At least that's not the story I got told when I was coming through Sunday school. But isn't this us? We're going to give credit to other people for God's grace, and then we're going to seek people to lead us instead of using God's guidance. So this is judge number five, Gideon. And, well, he's been given the idea, the thought, that he is supposed to vanquish the Midianites. That is the mission that it looks like God called him to do. But what if I was to tell you that, my friends, is not the priority mission of Gideon? So turn with you will, to Judges chapter 6. We're going to be in verses 25 through 32. We're not doing a lot of bouncing today. 
So you're just going to be able to stay put right there. And I want to kind of get you where we are. Remember, I gave you homework last week. I don't know how many people went home and read the chapter that I asked you to read to kind of make up for the sermon that we had to cut from the schedule. So hopefully you went home and did that. And we are just right after that. God wasted no time. What we're about to read today, well, this is coming right after Gideon's worship session with God. So right after God reassures Gideon, I'm in charge, I'm sending, go. What we're going to study today is exactly the first thing God told Gideon to do. Um, just so you know, it's before the fleece. Next week. Next week we'll talk about the fleece. But we're still not even to the point where God is dealing with that. This is before the army. This is before Gideon surrounded himself with 32,000 men. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. Um, this is before the battle. should have put that in quotes because there really was no battle. But we're not there yet in the story. Um, this mission was to be Gideon's starting point. Now, why is that important to me? Well, because if you remember the analogy that we're making, we have been called on a mission. We talked about that last week. Our mission is to go into all the nations, baptizing them, teaching them, and teaching them how to follow Christ, teaching them how, the things that the Bible says. That's what the mission is. That's our mission. But before we can take that mission, I think like you do, there's an assignment that we need to take on. So this is what it says. God's first assignment was to, in, to Gideon in Judges chapter 25 and 26. Take a second bull from your father's herd, and the one that is seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal, cut down the asher pole beside it, then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height, on, on top of this height. Using the wood of the asher pole you cut down, offer the second burnt bull as a as a, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. Now, I want to tell you something. When God gave Gideon this assignment, Gideon probably looked at God and said, God, I got a better idea. How about I go out and fight the Midianites with one hand tied behind my back, standing on one leg, and I'll use nothing but a toothpick? Because that's going to be easier than what God has now asked Gideon to do. Because this is serious business, because why does God say, start here? I mean, why not just get the army and go on out there and fight, it, fight Midian and just be done with this, right? We could have made this story a lot simpler, right? Well, remember, the Israelites and Gideon and us see the issue as the Midianites. The Midianites aren't the issue, folks. As a matter of fact, who sent the Midianites? God. The Midianites are the attention getter. They're not the issue. God sees the issue as the relationship. Israel's relationship to him, Israel has muddied the relationship. Now, what do I mean they muddied the relationship? Well, they are worshiping false gods. That should be little g, by the way. I just noticed that. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. Remember, this was rule number one. And God spoke. So God did not, like, send this. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Rule number one in the relationship. No other gods. But yet... Remember, what is Gideon supposed to go tear down? An altar, an asher pole. And what are those altar and asher poles used for? Other gods. Israel has messed it up. They're money in the relationship. And not only did they break rule number one, they didn't even get rule number two right. Rule number two says <laughs> no idols. Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven, above, or on the earth, beneath it, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. 
by showing love to the, to the thousands of gener- to the thousand generations of those who, who love me and keep my commandments. Rule number two, don't make an idol. It's not hard, right? Of course, what was next to that altar? An Asher pole. Do you know what an Asher pole is? We're, we're kind of more familiar with something that we call them in our history, totem poles. They were carved images of to the God that they used to represent the God, and they would actually do dances around these poles. They were used in a form of worship, and here is God's people out there with an altar to another God and an Asher pole and they're worshiping another God. But God, the Midianites have taken over our land. God, they're such cruel people. Lord, why aren't you fixing this problem for us? Squash them like the ants, right? They're not the problem, folks. You see, we want God to fix our problem. God wants us to mend the relationship. Wow. Hmm. Now, how do I do that? Well, good news is, is that he gave the recipe to Gideon. How to get right with God. And the first thing he says, prepare to sacrifice. Gideon, before you go, you go and get a second bull. Now remember, if you read your homework last week, you know he's already sacrificed one bull. By the way, whose bulls were they? Dad's. Um, I'm not much of a cow farmer, but I do know that sacrificing two bulls when you're trying to raise cows is not a good move. Okay, because you probably don't have them. Remember, food and livestock were already a scarce thing. Midian had been thin. So take the second bull from your dad and get ready to go sacrifice. I don't know. This is a smart move for Gideon. I mean, you think dad's going to miss the second bull? You think God, dad's going to wonder, where's the bull? But you can't underestimate this moment. Because God said, if you're going to get right with me, you're going to have to take some responsibility for what you've done. If you're going to get right in the relationship, you're going to have to sacrifice something to mend the relationship. And a lot of times we forget that. We think the idea of repentance is saying, I'm sorry and apologizing. God does not want your apology. God wants your repentance. See, an apology just admits that, well, something went wrong. Somebody got their feelings hurt. Maybe I had some responsibility. Repentance is, God, this is all on me. God, you stayed right where you were, and it's I went the opposite direction, and so you have to work this into the idea of if you're going to get right with God, it's going to cost something. Yes, salvation is the free gift of God, but you know what? To have that gift in your life, you just, it costs something. It does. I'm sorry to tell you this, and when God says, Gideon, we've got to get this right, it costs something. And then he says it. Go and tear down daddy's altar and daddy's pole. You know what? I know what my dad would have been like if I'd have went out in the middle of the night and tore down something that he had spent a lot of time putting together and then took one of his prized possessions and, like, sacrificed it. I'm like, God, really? Toothpick. Look, I can go do this. That would be easier. You want me to go do what? You understand what God's saying, though, right? All of those things that you built up that you think is all good and all those things that you have in your life and all of those little idols that you put in your place and all of those things that you're worshiping instead of me, tear them down. Don't leave a stitch of them. Tear them down. Take down the altar, chop down the pole. By the way, we'll talk about what we're going to do with the pole later, but it can't stay the way it is, if we're going to get right with God. Now, again, I think we miss this sometimes. Because we want to get right with God, but we want to bring all the baggage with us. Well, God, I, I, I really like what I'm doing. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, after he tears it down, I want you to understand, never let it be said that God doesn't have an interesting sense of humor. Because after he says tear it down, he looks at Gideon and says, now, after you tear all that down... Um, 
I want you to build a new. Where was Gideon supposed to get the, the materials to build the new altar to God? God wants you to recycle the ones that were there for Baal, and now I want you to build an altar to me. Well, oh, okay. God, where am I supposed to get the wood to burn, do that burnt sacrifice? You know that pole you chopped down? Put it on the altar and strike a match to it and light it on fire. There's your wood. God, where would you like me to build this altar? You know that real estate that they used to use for those, those, those pagan rituals? I want you to build it right there in Daddy's backyard. Really, God? Yeah. You get the picture, right? God's making a statement here. You can't go and save the world until you get your own house right. You can't ever take on God's mission until you are ready to start right here in your own backyard. What are the things that I'm unwilling to sacrifice? What are the things that I need, that need to be tore down? What are the things that I need to rebuild? And when it's all done, now he says, sacrifice. Do you not find that ironic? Where does getting right with God start with? Preparing the sacrifice. Where does getting right God with God end with? Sacrifice. Hmm. You think that maybe God's point can a point here? Maybe it should be screaming out across generations? That maybe the problem is, is that the reason we can't accept God's mission is because our own house isn't in order. Maybe we're guilty of worshiping some false gods. Maybe we're guilty of having a few idols. Now, again, if I was Gideon, I think I'd be looking for another deal with God, but I have to give Gideon his proffers. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did, the, did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople... He did it at night rather than in the daytime. And here comes that first mask. A lot of times when you read this verse and we read that Gideon was afraid and said, we want to put a mask of coward on Gideon. I want to let you know something. When I was a teenager, I did a lot of things I shouldn't do. And you know when I always did them? At night. Why? Because I didn't want to get caught. Because the hope was maybe I'd live long enough to do something else. So Gideon is a very shrewd individual. He realizes if I go in the middle of the day and I bring my sledgehammer and I bring my people with me and I'm going to tear down this altar and I'm going to make this big show and spectacle of it, I'm probably not even going to make it to the altar and they're going to lynch me. So he does the shrewd thing. Remember what Jesus told us? We're supposed to be as gentle as lambs, as shrewd as serpents. He does the shrewd thing and he gets ten of his buddies together. And he says, we're going to have some fun tonight, guys. Yeah, I'm sure they're looking at that. It ain't going to be fun getting him, but okay, we're with you. And they go out, and they do exactly what God said to do. And I'm going to tell you something. I would think that when Israel got up the next morning, they'd be like, thank you, Gideon. Thank you. Preach on. I'm so glad you did it. You know how they responded? This is how they responded. In the morning... When the people of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished. With the ash pole beside it cut down, with the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar, they asked each other, who did this? Now, again, I, I want you to get the picture. There was this nice, pretty, pristine altar that I'm sure everybody oohed and awed over and over this, this nice carved pole now was a burnt bloody cow laying on a rock. And the people are like, who did this? Who, who's responsible for such a thing? And then they went a step further. When they carefully investigated, they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. See, I got to give Gideon some lessons because really you got to do this in such a way you don't get caught. Seriously. Um, but, but they did the investigation and they figured out it's Gideon. And here's what happened. The people of the town demanded of Joash, bring out your son. He must 
die because he had broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asher pole beside it. How dare Gideon challenge our religion? How dare he enrage Baal? Doesn't he know this God's going to be all over us now? You know what that's going to do to the Midianites if they see that you tore down their altar? How dare you chop down that pole? Don't you know somebody put a lot of effort into carving that pole? Don't you know that pole's been sitting there for years? That pole wasn't bothering anybody. How dare you chop down a pole? How dare you sacrifice that cow? Don't you know? Food's hard to come by these days. Don't you know? You can use that cow, and if you have some female cows, you can make a whole bunch more cows. What are you doing, Gideon? That's a waste of resources doing that. See, they were so upset. They wanted to kill him. They didn't praise him for taking a stand for God. They didn't celebrate how much he was going to, he was willing to take the risk. They could not even see it because they were just so blind. Anybody else think that's a weird response from people that call themselves God's people? I mean, after all, what was destroyed was some stacked rocks and a wooden pole. Was there anything special about them? Not in the eyes of God. Matter of fact, he's the one that said, tear them down. And what would what, he say? You're not going to like the answer. As a matter of fact, the answer just might hurt your feelings a little bit. The answer might just squish your toes quite a bit. Because the answer is they were wearing a mask. They were wearing the mask of false faith. Fact. They loved their religion more than they valued their relationship. Is that not a sobering thought? They valued the things that they worshipped more than the God they were supposed to worship. That's what I mean by they muddied their relationship. They have so fallen in love with the symbols of their religion that when God sent somebody to set the record straight, they wanted to kill him. See, the fact is, the religion is comfortable and convenient. If I'm going to have a religion, I can take your calendar and I can put a time slot. Let's just say 10, 30, 11, 30 on Sunday morning. That, that sounds like a good random time to pick. And I can tell you that you should be here from 10, 30 to 11, 30 on a Sunday morning. And that's our time to worship God. That's a religion. If I'm going to have the relationship, that's going to be a little more messy and difficult. I have relationships in my life. I have two kids. I have a wife. I have parents. Mary has informed me I'm part of the sandwich generation, sandwiched between my kids and my parents. Um, and I understand that staying very much so these days. And so I have a lot of relationships. And you know the funny thing I, ha I have? It frustrates me the, the daylights out of me. Relationships never work on a clock. I'm sorry, I can't call somebody and say, okay, you've got between 10 and five, I mean, 10 and 11 on Wednesday to have your crisis moment. If you can't do it, oh well. Could you imagine trying to raise your kids that way? Could you imagine trying to be married to your spouse that way? You've got this little bitty time slot, and we're going to, that's not how relationships work. My relationships run 24-7. Sometimes they interrupt things that I had planned doing in my religious schedule. But you get what had happened, right? They had become so accustomed to their religion that when somebody confronted them with the relationship, killing, how dare he demolish that idol? How dare he 
tell me that I need to get right with God. You see, the religion, they could live how they wanted. And in the religion, sure, have an altar, have two or three, have a dozen, the more the merrier, right? In the religion, do whatever you want. We'll figure out how to make it work. We'll just change a rule here and there as we go, and the religion will make it all okay. You know what? Got this problem you're struggling with? Don't worry. We'll come up with some way that you can, you can make amends for what you did wrong. That's religion. The relationship? That's it. Boundaries. Did you not hear those first two rules I read you? It didn't say if you feel like it. What did God say? Thou shalt not. Period. No gray area. Don't do it. And if I'm going to live in that relationship, that's what I have to do. And I'm sure you get where I'm driving, right? We call ourselves the church. And I showed you last week that makes you the chosen people. And so I have to ask the question. Do we, the chosen people of God, love the religion more than we value our God? I told you. Not an easy answer. This is a hard mask to take off because sometimes my religion gets so intertwined with my God that I can't tell one from the other. Yeah, I can. What if I take the religion away? Do you still follow God? I don't know. You move that cross, and, and I don't know. It just wouldn't be the same. I don't know. If we sold this building and had to go meet in the school, it just wouldn't be the same. I don't know. If, if we sang different kind of songs, it, it just ain't the same. You get it, right? That's religion. Of course it's not the same. I have a very sad moment happening next Saturday. I'm going to lose a teenager. No, he's, he's not sick. He's not going anywhere. But he turns 20 next Saturday. Yeah, you're shaking your heads too because y'all remember, right? My relationship with Caleb is not the same as the relationship as when he was five. I know sometimes he thinks I still treat him like he's five. But it's not the same relationship. We don't talk about the same topics. We don't have the relationship didn't stay the same. The relationship grew. And it changed. And you know what? We need to think about that same thing with our relationship with God. If it always has to stay the same, in order for you to have the relationship, do you really have a relationship? Or do you just have your religion? You put the right things in the right place and you come at the right time so you can say, check the box. Because Gideon says, that's the priority. The priority isn't that we go out and take care of the Midianites. We start right here. Judges chapter, chapter 6, verses 31 through 32. But Joash responded, finally, here's dad stepping up. I got a sneaking suspicion that when Joash stepped up, Gideon is thinking, I am a dead man. Okay, forget the crowd. Dad's going to kill me. Dad's altar. Remember, dad. Dad's pole. The second cow from dad's lot. I'm sure he's thinking, my life is over. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. Wow. That's some serious words from this guy. And then he goes on to challenge him even more. If Baal is really a god, he can defend himself when somebody breaks down his altar. So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name Jerubbaal that day, saying, let Baal contend with him. It took his youngest son stepping up and doing what God said, but dad finally got the message. 
And you know what? That's hard. I mean, Dad stood up and he challenged the crowd. Now, you get what's going to probably, you, you've seen people that are really upset these days, right? If you haven't, turn on the television and watch for five minutes. You will find somebody that's, you don't even have to channel surf. Just pick a channel. It'll come to you eventually. When Dad stood up, you realize what's the very likelihood is going to happen next, right? They're going to lynch Dad right next to Gideon. And Dad's like, I don't care. I get what my son did. And it's my responsibility because I'm the dad. I should have been the one out here tearing down the altar. I'm the one that should have been chopping down the pole. I'm the one. It's me. And you're not going to take my son without me. I commend dad for that. But he doesn't stop there. Then he just drags them right down into the mud and says, tell you what, if Baal is really a god, He'll come and deal with it. We've seen Jehovah deal with things in the past, right? So you just leave him alone, and we'll just see whether or not Baal is really a god or not. And his dad is sitting there, and he's looking at what used to be his altar. Now it's a different kind of altar. And as he's looking at that Asher pole that now is on the altar, and he's looking at that second cow and probably thinking, that's going to cost me. Dad came to the realization, folks. It starts here. We say we want to reach the world. I know we say it. I read it in our purpose statement. We want to meet people where they are. I, I've heard other people quote Matthew chapter 28 around here, not just me. I'm not the only one that does it. We're always talking about the need to reach people. But you do understand, if we are serious about that mission, it begins with taking off the mask of our fake faith and writing our own house. Looking around our backyard, asking ourselves, what do I need to take out of this religion in order to make room for the relationship? And I want to tell you something, when you start doing that, there's probably going to be some people that are going to be very upset. Oh, well. God's way or their way. Sometimes you have to pick. But you do get, could you imagine trying to go out to the world and witness and share Christ with them if you were wearing a mask like you see on the screen right now? They would look, be looking for the machete and the little heep, 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 heep that comes to Friday the 13th because that's a scary mask. Folks. That's creepy. No, they don't want to see our religious mask. What do they want to see? They want to see the face of the relationship that's living with God on an everyday basis. And make no mistake about it. If we, the church, are going to survive, and if we, the church, are going to reach the world, then we've got to do it. We've got to prepare ourselves that it's going to cost us something to do this. It's going to cost some sacrifice. It means that we may have to tear down some things that we had built up in the past. It may mean that I have to build something new in its place that is a better tool for reaching people. And then it's going to end with the idea of actually taking what we prepared to sacrifice and actually putting it on the altar and lighting it on fire. And when the world sees the church doing that, they're going to say, this is serious. The sleeping giant has awoke, and they're coming for the world. But we're not going to do that until we write the house. 